I'm Colonel Liam Collins, professor uh, in the Defense and Strategic Studies program, an interdis interdisciplinary major within the Department of Military Instruction, and the director of our Modern War Institute. And the charter of the Modern War Institute is to provide you with the intellectual tools on recent and ongoing conflicts, to educate you and provide you with the necessary problem-solving skills to win in a complex world. We partnered with MS-100 to bring you today's guest speaker, Mr. Eric Maddox. Mr. Maddox is a speaker, negotiator, author, and served in the Army for 10 years. From 1994 to 2000, he served in the uh, 82nd Airborne Division as an infantry paratrooper where he earned his Ranger tab. In 2000, he re-enlisted re as a Chinese translator and was assigned to the American Embassy in Beijing. In 2003, with the Army uh, in desperate need of interrogators in Iraq, he received uh, Staff Sergeant Maddox at the time received orders to report to Baghdad um, in the summer of 2003. After leaving the Army in 2004, he was hired by the Defense Intelligence Agency as a civilian interrogator. In total, since 2003, he, had con he has conducted over 2,700 interrogations while deployed eight times to Iraq, Afghanistan, the Philippines, Bosnia, and other undisclosed locations. In the not too distant future, you'll you may find yourself, like Mr. Maddox, lacking the education and training for what was required for the situation at hand. About the only certainty that I can tell you is that you'll find yourself in some kind of uncertain environment that you don't expect. You should or we will give you the tools to be physically fit and to be technically and tactically proficient, but will you have the necessary intellectual skills to be successful? To be successful requires critical thinking and creative problem-solving skills. The foundation for your technical and tactical expertise and proficiency starts right here in MS-100 with the ability to conduct effective analysis of the enemy and mission analysis. Another benefit of having Mr. Maddox today is he'll, he's characteristic of the outstanding non-commissioned officers that you'll get to work with over your career in the military, something you don't get exposed to enough here at the United States Military Academy. To set the stage for today's presentation, I'll provide some context as Eric and I underlapped in Iraq, I went out as he came in and he left right before I got back again. In the spring of 2003, I was on operational deployment with two other uh, special operations forces or soft NCOs to South America when I got a call from my commander saying I had to come home. We were leaving for Iraq within 24 hours. As it happened, Turkey wouldn't support the ground invasion into Iraq, so less than 200 of us were going to have to go and uh, go where the entire division was in the West and take their place. So left my suits at the cleaners, caught a plane home, and was into Iraq the next day. With the fall of Baghdad, our mission quickly changed, and the capture of the former regime leadership, or what you guys probably don't remember now, or maybe you just barely do, right, the, 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 the leadership that was famously depicted on the, on the 52 playing cards, or the blacklist. I captured several of them earlier in the summer of 2003, to include Saddam's confidential secretary, which is blacklist number four, the Ace of Diamonds. My successor was able to capture Saddam's sons, Uday and Kuse, blacklist number three and four in July, but the trail for Saddam quickly ran cold. We lacked the robust signal intelligence that you have today and the intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance platforms uh, that many of you will take or take for granted. And to put it into context, you know, how, how, uh, how impressive this was, you know, consider that many of the FBI's most wanted remain, on that, remain at, at large for decades at a time before finally being captured. And that's in a country where you know the culture and you speak the language. So trying to find Saddam with no leads was a particularly daunting task. And Staff Sergeant Maddox played a critical role in that. His story is a story of uh, innovation and persistence. He and a small group of uh, Special Operations Force soldiers supported by the 4th Infantry Division had to figure out how to find Saddam on their own. And as they were closing in on him and getting closer to finding him, the entire intelligence community, you know, didn't believe him, didn't think they were close. I jokingly tell Eric that he did his job too well because had he waited just a few more weeks to capture Saddam, then I would have been the one to capture him. But, you know, that's what we want. We want him to go out there and, and, and do a great job. And unfortunately, I did not get a replacement as good as Eric. Uh, my strategic debriefer that I got in his place uh, wasn't even sure what the Stockholm Syndrome was, and so I had to send him home after that. Uh, and I want to remind you, as, as, as we're about to get started, as bring him up here, uh, that the views expressed today 
do not necessarily reflect uh, the views of West Point, the Army, or the Department of Defense. And with that, please give a warm West Point welcome to Mr. Eric Maddox. In 2003, when the United States went to war in Iraq, I was a staff sergeant in the United States Army. I was a trained interrogator, but I'd never actually conducted a real interrogation. See, along with training me in interrogations, the United States military also taught me Chinese Mandarin. And for years, the military had decided that I was much more valuable as a Chinese Mandarin linguist than I would ever be as an interrogator. Matter of fact, they told me I would never actually conduct an interrogation. And when we were preparing to invade Iraq, I was stationed in Los Angeles, California. They pulled me out of army uniform and I wore civilian clothes. Every day I was responsible for interviewing Chinese citizens who were caught trying to illegally enter the United States through the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And I was told 100% that I wouldn't be going to Iraq. So you can imagine the shock I felt when three months into the war, I show up for work and my commander hands me orders for the Baghdad International Airport. And I was supposed to leave in 10 days. And I sat there and I, I said, what group, what unit am I going with? And he said, Eric, I don't know. These just showed up and they're classified. It's some crazy task force that I've never heard of and it's just you. So, I was a staff sergeant at the time, and we staff sergeants, we always tell the privates, we say, hey, listen, if you don't know something, just ask. And we have this saying, you guys probably heard it, there are no stupid questions, just ask. And I remember standing there in front of my commander thinking, Man, I am about to disprove that notion. And I looked at him and I said, Sir, do they speak Chinese in Iraq? <laughs> he said, No. I said, Well, what am I supposed to do? That's all I've done for years. I'm a Chinese Mandarin linguist. I'm like, What? And he just he stops me and he said, Eric, I don't know. But I accepted the orders, and 10 days later, I boarded a military aircraft, and I took off for the Baghdad International Airport. And when I get there, I'm picked up by this team of soldiers, right? And they're in civilian clothes, and they got full beards. See, we, we Army people that I've been around, we wear uniforms, and we shave every single day. So I jump in with the truck with these guys, and we're driving through the Baghdad International Airport, and they pull into this real fortified compound, right? And we go into this building. Of course, it doesn't have any windows. And we go through this hall, and we go in this room, and they set me down. And the bearded soldier is sitting across me, and they look at me, and they said, are you familiar with JSOC? And I knew it was some sort of military acronym, because that's all we use. <laughs> and then I said, I I don't know what that means. And they said, it's the Joint Special Operations Command. And I looked at him and I said, man, that sounds awesome. <laughs> that sounds really hardcore. I don't know what that is. And they said, we're the Joint Special Operations Command. We are the task force, the United States military, responsible for tracking down the most wanted people on Earth. And ever since we invaded Iraq, the most wanted man in the world is Saddam Hussein. He is the ace of spades. 
They said, as a task force in this war, our exclusive mission is to kill or capture every single person on the deck of cards. And, and I don't know if you guys remember, or you had to learn about military history. When we invaded Iraq, the Department of Defense, we created this deck of playing cards that you'd play poker with. And it was Saddam and the top 55 cronies, right? They were the most wanted list. These bearded soldiers said, we're here to get Saddam. And I sat there, and I was obviously in shock. And I said, well, that's freaking awesome. And, and I can't think of a better group of individuals to go get that guy than you all. <laughs> with your beards and everything. I said, what do, you, what do you want with me? I'm a Chinese Mandarin linguist. And one of the bearded soldiers said, you're an interrogator. I said, no, 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 no. You all know I've never done an interrogation before in my entire life. And I, was, I, I looked at him seriously and I said, what am I doing here? And they said, Eric, listen, we're, we're the interrogators for the task force. And, and we're going after Saddam, and we think he's probably here in Baghdad. And every night, we're going on four or five missions a night to capture Saddam Hussein. He said, but we got all these special operation teams scattered throughout the country. He goes, they keep freaking calling us and, and want an interrogator to go with them, to go on the raids and to be out in the middle of nowhere in Iraq. They said, we're not, we're not infantry guys, Eric. So, so we, we called up the Army and said... Hey, give us a list of all interrogators who are infantry. And, and, and we'd love to have anyone that's got like a ranger tab, right? It's graduated ranger school. I said, Eric, there was one person on the list. <laughs> so welcome to Baghdad. But I was excited, right? Like, I got to join this task force. I didn't know anything about it, but I knew what that deck of cars was, right? Because I watched the news. And I've been there for just a couple of days in Baghdad with this task force, these interrogators. And one evening, the senior interrogator came up and he says, Eric, you got to go to Tikrit. He said, we got a Delta Force team up there, and they are going on a raid tonight. And they've request requested to have an interrogator go with them. I said, so, you know, we're sending you. I said, okay. You know, I'll, I'll go, obviously. I said, but I, I feel obligated to tell you that um, I cannot think of anyone less qualified <laughs> to go on that raid tonight than me. I said, I just got here. I just figured out how to get to the mess hall and back. I said, I'm a Chinese Mandarin linguist. And the senior interrogator said, Eric, relax. He goes, there's, there's something you need to understand. Um, it's Tikrit, right? Uh, okay, so it's Saddam Hussein al-Tikriti. That means Saddam was from Tikrit. He said, Eric, it's this little bitty town. There's 20,000 people in it, and it's right in the middle of the Sunni Triangle. And when we invaded Iraq, we thought this was you know, the, one of the most important locations. He says, when we invaded, we dropped 10,000 soldiers into Tikrit. So when we invaded, we went through every single house. We've cleared it of bad guys. He said, for months, we haven't found a single individual on the deck of cards in Tikrit. He said, Eric, Tikrit just doesn't matter. He says, but we got this Delta Force team up there, and, you know, Delta Force, I mean, if they ask for something, they get it. And uh, they asked for an interrogator, so we're sending the new guy. <laughs> so I packed a change of clothes, and that night they, drove, they flew me up on this little bitty helicopter. And in the middle of the night, I'm picked up by these Delta Force operators, right? And I mean, we go back to their little house, and I don't know what they're doing, but these guys are getting ready for a raid. And they tell me I'm going with them. And we leave the secure compound, the wire there in Tikrit, and we're driving through this little bitty hometown of Saddam Hussein. And these Delta guys drive up alongside this house, and they jump out, and they raided it. Video game style, right? I'm not kidding. They go in, and 
I'm sitting there with the commander. He's back with these babies sitting me, right? And they're shooting and guns are ablazing. And all of a sudden, silence. They come out and they said, secure. The commander looks at me and he said, go interrogate them. <laughs> so I did. I went in there and there was a couple of men in there and I talked to them and I asked them a few questions. And I really don't remember anything. I mean, I'm, I'm overloaded, right? But I tried to act like it was cool, and I'm asking questions. I have no idea what, what they said, but after that, we went on a second raid, and then we went on a third raid, and the sun is starting to come up, and that's when we got to go back, right, get into the secure compound. We drive back to the base, and I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, you're alive. We're cool. You were golfing in Long Beach last week, and now you're doing raids with Delta Force. So we're good. And I thought they were going to fly me back to Baghdad. And the commander, he comes up to me and he said, all right, you're going to be working for me. I said, great. Um, what, what do you need me to do exactly? Stuff last night? Because I, I didn't do anything. I don't even know what I asked those people. What, what do you need? He said, Eric, we're here in Tikrit. He said, there's nobody on the deck of cards here. He goes, but there's an insurgency going on. He goes, maybe there's no high-value targets, but every day the U.S. soldiers are getting shot up and killed by this insurgency, and we don't know who they are. He goes, we drive down the streets during the day, and all these locals are waving at us, tell us how happy they are that the Americans are there, and at night we're getting blown up. He goes, I want you to go in there and I want you to interrogate every single prisoner that the army has at this prison here in Tikrit. And he said, you find the bad guys. And, and I know I had not really ever done an interrogation before, but I understood that mission. And to me, that was perfectly clear. And I was excited to be there. I didn't care if there were any high-value targets. I mean, who am I to go find a high-value target, right? I just want to help this group of soldiers. And the next day, I went down to the prison, and I got a couple of the prisoners, and I brought them to this little house where they had a room set up, and I was going to do my interrogations. And I brought the first prisoner in, and I started interrogating him. And I told myself, I said, the Army taught you, man. You know the techniques. Use what the Army trained you to do and get this prisoner to break. Break means the guy says, okay, you got me. I'm a bad guy, and here's everything I know, Mr. Interrogator. Here's all the intel I have. And I started using the army techniques and I interrogated this prison for hours and hours. And I told myself, I'm not gonna stop till this guy breaks. Well, 14 hours later, I was exhausted and he didn't break. So I put him up and I got the other prisoner and I started interrogating him. He didn't break. But the next day I told myself, I said, you keep at it, man. You're working for these guys, they need you. And every single day I interrogated all day and all night and I went through about 20 prisoners. And I didn't get a single prisoner to talk. I didn't break. And I'm asking myself, I'm like, Eric, are you that bad of an interrogator? <laughs> and believe it or not, I was smart. I brought my army interrogation manual. Right? Because I'd never done one, and I thought, I remember this in school, and I brought, I even went to the prison and found the other interrogator units, right, that were just with the conventional forces, and I said, hey, what are you all doing? What, what, what do you, how do you open these guys up? And they said, nobody talks. Nobody breaks. I said, well, what do you do? I said, man, we just yell at them. That's what the commander wants us to do. We just, we just interrogate them. And I looked at the manual and every technique was based upon the fact that our enemy was supposed to be in a, in, in, in a uniform, working for the enemy country's military, on the battlefield with a smoking gun. But these prisoners, right, they're civilians, they're insurgents, they have days at, at jobs during the daytime and at night they make IEDs or they're part of this insurgency group and there's no smoking weapon, there's no chain of command. And after two weeks, I finally asked myself, I said, are you going to do this for six months? Are you going to spend the next six months getting zero intel, getting no one to break? 
And I said, there's no way that's what the army wants me to do. They did not send me here to do that. I finally said, how do I get them to talk? I said, just, just try to open them up. What do I do? And I, I realized the zero-sum game, the yelling and the screaming, that's where my prisoners shut down. And I told myself, next prisoner I bring in here, I'm going to set them down, I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to see how long I can keep this guy talking. I'm not going to accuse him of anything. I don't even care if he gives me any intel. I'm going to see how long I can keep this prisoner talking. And I brought him in. I just started talking to the guy, right, about his friends and his family and life. And he would talk to me. He's a chatterbox, right? He's nervous. He just wants to talk. He wants somebody to talk to. And he's telling me how innocent he is. And I didn't care. But, he, but it was this awesome history lesson, right? Because I'm a Chinese Mandarin specialist. And he's teaching me, he's telling me all about Iraq and Saddam, what it means to be Sunni and live under this dictator and living in this town of Tikrit. We went for eight straight hours and this guy kept talking. I just said, next prisoner, I'm going to bring in. I'm just, just going to talk to him. And I, and I could. I could bring the prisoner. I'd sit him down, and they would talk to me. What I also realized when I'm talking to this prisoner, I could listen to him, and I knew when they were lying to me. And I didn't, I didn't tell him. I didn't call him on those lies. I just sat there, and I made a note of it. And I thought, this, this works, okay. Maybe this is what an interrogator does, right? Like, they don't actually break. You just sit and talk to a guy, and then you figure out the lies, and you go tell the commander, here's what he's lying about. Maybe that's important. And I'm going through these prisoners. One day I'm sitting, and I'm talking to this prisoner all day long. And I'm catching him in his lies, but I'm not telling him. And finally, the prisoner looks at me, and he says, Mr. Inspector, that's what they call me, they call me Mr. Inspector, when are you going to let me go? I was like, let you go? Why would I let you go? He said, I'm your buddy, man. He goes, I haven't told you a single lie. We're chatting it up like this. I'm innocent. And I said, really? You're innocent? He goes, I haven't told you a single lie. He goes, if I told you a single lie, he goes, you can kill me. And I, my, I started thinking. I said, okay, what do I do with this guy? And I told him, I said, uh, okay, I can't kill you. Uh, but I'll make a deal with you. If you haven't told me a single lie, I'll let you walk out that door. You'll be a free man right now. If you have not told me a lie, you go home right now. I said, but one lie, just one single lie. If you've told me a lie, you have to stay the rest of your life in this prison. And he's kind of looking at me. And he's sizing me up. And he said, I haven't told you a lie. And I said, one lie the rest of your life. And he says, deal. And I looked at him and I said, how many brothers do you have? We talked about his family. He said, I told you, I have three. And I looked at him and I said, you have four brothers. And my prisoner's jaw just drops. He's shocked. And I said, land, how much land do you own? He said he was a farmer. I said, how much farm and land do you own? And he said, uh. I have 80 acres, I told you. I said, 200. I said, you have over 200 acres of land. And he's shocked. And he can't say anything. And I said, what was our deal? What was our deal? What was the deal we just made about lies? And the prisoner's shocked. And he looks at me and he goes, can we cut a new deal? <laughs> what do I do, right? I've never been in this situation. And I said, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. New deal. We can cut a new deal. Uh, I said, listen, I need to know who's, who's the threat. You live in your neighborhood. I said, I don't need to know all the bad guys. I said, who's threatening us? Who's putting you up to this? And he's like, I don't know. I said, that's the third lie. You will spend the rest of your life in this prison. And I knew he was lying to me about his brother. I said, your brother's in. I know your brother's in. And he said, I, I can't. I can't give you my brother. I said, I will get him out. I will protect him. Give me his bosses. Give me his bosses. I want your brother's bosses. Then I don't need your brother. And he looks at me and he goes, if I give you my brother's bosses, they'll know it was me and they'll kill all my family. And I said, help your brother. 
I said, make me not go after your brother. What do I do? And my prisoner's thinking, he goes, he goes, man, there's a lot of bad guys you don't know about. He goes, I'll take you to a couple of those. And then if you could go get my brother's boss, they'll think those guys did it and they won't know it was me. And I looked at him and I said, man, that's an awesome idea. <laughs> right? And I went to my commander and I said, I got this. I said, I just got some intel. I got him to break. And my commander at the time is, his name's Bam Bam. Bam Bam looks at me and he said, uh, that, that's not what we do. He goes, we don't, we don't take information from the enemy and send our guys out on raids. He's like, that's how we get people killed. And I said, I, I think this stuff's legit. And he said, Eric, just, just keep doing what you're doing. He goes, we're real. You're doing a great job, man. Just keep doing what you're doing. And I accepted that, right? Like, it made sense. We, we can't listen to the bad guys. And the way Bam Bam and the team, they got all their intel right, they had, they had these CIA case officers and they brought in intel to them. And, they had, and we had these spies throughout the Sunni Triangle and the spies brought in the intel and then they, we would go and do these raids. And, and one day, our CIA guy gets shot, right? And it was serious enough, they sent him out of the country. And Bam Bam calls the CIA and says, I need a replacement. You know, my CIA, I need a, a new case officer. And they told Bam Bam, they said, you got an intel guy. They said, just use that interrogator. We're not sending you a replacement. See, Tikrit was so unimportant. There was nobody in Tikrit so badly. The CIA didn't even want to send a second guy, a replacement. And Bam Bam comes up to me and he says, Eric, I got to let you go. He goes, I can't keep you around or CIA is not going to replace you. And I told him, I said, don't send me home. I said, I, I can get you intel. I said, I'm figuring out how to get these prisoners to break. I'm getting this stuff. I said, Bam Bam, the CIA, they're on the outside. They, you, they try to find good people that we can trust to infiltrate the bad guys. I said, I've got the bad guys who I'm turning who are going to give us information. I said, we can get on the inside. I said, this city, you've got to understand, Tikrit is so small, everybody knows each other. You can't have an outsider penetrate the circle of trust of these insurgents. I said, I can get in there. Just give me a little bit of time. And he said, so let me get this straight. You want me to call the CIA and say... I don't need a replacement, great idea, I'm gonna keep the Chinese Mandarin linguist. And I said, yeah. And he said, all right, I just need to make sure I had that right. And he calls the CIA and he says, we're all set. So now I'm pumped, right? I got Bam Bam, the Delta Force commander, trust me, and I went to work on these prisoners, but I could open them up now, and I could get intel and I would talk to them, I would cut a deal with them, catch them in their lies, reveal the lies, and then find them a way out. Try to help them with their friends or relatives they got involved in, go after their bosses, go after somebody else first, blame it on them, the whole system. As we did this, these prisoners opened up and started flooding us with names of the insurgency. And we started making a link diagram, right? And it, it went from dozens of names to hundreds of names. Then it had a thousand names on it. And after six weeks of this, it had 2,000 names on this link diagram. And every night, the team would figure out, hey, which one of these insurgent fighters do we want to go after and bring them back? And I'd get new prisoners. And the more I learned about this insurgency, the more I realized, wow, some of these insurgents, they have subcommanders and regional commanders. So it became structured, right? I thought it was just random people that were upset at us. But eventually I realized this whole thing's tangled together and it has a chain of command. And after two months of this, I realized, oh my goodness, it has a leader. Every single person in this insurgency, in the Sunni Triangle, they, they're under the command of this one man. His name's Muhammad Ibrahim Omar al-Muslit. And he was a former bodyguard of Saddam Hussein. See, Saddam was a brutal dictator, so pretty much everyone wanted to kill him, not just us, even his own people. So he had these dozens of bodyguards. 
And he had inner circle and second circle and third circle. And one of his inner circle bodyguards was this Muhammad Ibrahim. And he was running this insurgency. And I finally went to Bam Bam and I said, man, every night we're going after bad guys. I said, can we focus on this bodyguard? He's the top guy. I said, I, I don't need low hanging fruit. I said, we've got to go directly to the head. I think we can cut the head off the snake. And he said, do it. Go for it. And from that point on, all we did was go after friends and relatives and business partners of this Muhammad Ibrahim. And when we got our focus on this one guy, we were able to find some of his brothers and his cousins. And they would eventually start opening up and they start talking about this Muhammad Ibrahim. And, and I was trying to figure out, who is this guy, right? And, and it was, I couldn't put it together. See, Muhammad Ibrahim, this bodyguard, Saddam had 30 inner circle bodyguards. And, and they were all big, deadly, mean, bruising guys except for Muhammad Ibrahim. He's a fun-loving, nicest guy in the world, didn't have an enemy in the world, and loved to drink whiskey and play dominoes. Yet when I talked to the prisoners, he was like a god. And the closer I got to him, the more I, I see the split personality, it finally occurred to me. I said, he, he's with Saddam. He has to be. This guy's a nobody. He's a joking, friendly, fun-loving guy. And I went to Bam Bam and I said, I think Saddam Hussein's in Tikrit. He's like, well, you can't tell anybody else that or you will get fired for being an idiot. <laughs> and I said, I'm serious. I, I think he's here. And Bam Bam said, Eric, before you and I got here, they went to every single house. He goes, I know we didn't get the most experienced interrogator in the world. Why do you think that is? He said, because nobody's in Tikrit. And he looks at me and he said, Eric, you notice all these Delta operators are hurt? It's true. This team of operators in Tikrit, they had blown backs, slipped discs, blown knees. It was like a mash unit. <clears throat> I thought they just trained so hard they were all hurt. He goes, anywhere around the country, if an operator gets hurt, they send them here. Because they don't want to go home. They want to stay with their group. But this is where they send the broke guys. Because this place doesn't matter. And I said, Bam Bam, Saddam Hussein is in Tikrit. And I can prove it. And he said, well, go find him. And I said, well, I'm going to. And I did. I continued my interrogations. And the closer we're getting to him, I finally found a prisoner who opens up to me and he says, this Muhammad Ibrahim, his bodyguard, he's got a driver. He said, the driver knows everything. And they're explaining this to me. And they said, the driver's sitting at home. He's, he lives right next to, to the governor's mansion there in Tikrit. He goes, he's sitting there, you can go get him, the driver of Muhammad Ibrahim. And I went to Bam Bam, and I said, listen, I found the driver of Muhammad Ibrahim. He knows everything. We can drive to his house right now. And Bam Bam says, why does he live next to the governor's mansion? And he says, well, <clears throat> the driver of Muhammad Ibrahim, the guy who's running the insurgency, the driver's related to the head of security for the governor. So to explain the political dynamics of this, we Americans, we invaded Iraq, right? And we kicked Saddam out of power, and Tikrit's the head of the Sunni triangle. So we had to put a governor in charge. Well, we put our own puppet guy in. And, and, and all the Tikrit locals, all the Sunnis, wanted to kill that governor. And, and the only way he stayed alive was he had this head of security. And the head of security was literally, was the United States military's best friend because he kept the governor alive. And the head of security's cousin was the driver of Muhammad Ibrahim who was running the insurgency. Are you guys tracking? <laughs> and I explained all this to Bam Bam. I said, we got to go after that driver. And he said, that driver's untouchable. He goes, you can't touch the governor. He's our puppet. His head of security's our best friend. And any of his relatives, you can't touch them. And I said, bam, bam, 
I got to have that driver. And he said, Eric, we're into Crete where nothing matters. There's nobody important here. All we have to do is not upset the governor. And I said, I need that driver. And Bam Bam brought in the team, and he looks at me, and he said, if I go get that driver, you have to make him talk, or this whole house is getting shut down. And I said, just get me the driver. And that night, they went, and they conducted the raid, and they captured the driver of Muhammad Ibrahim. And before we got back to our house, the governor of Tikrit called our house saying, Dude, you made a mistake. You've got to let that guy know. And Bam Bam says, no, nope, he's, he's our prisoner. He's staying with us. And the phone conversation ended with the guy telling Bam Bam, I'm now going to call the president. I'm now calling President Bush. And Bam Bam looks at me and he says, you got about 10 hours before this thing gets shut down. So there's no pressure there. But I began my interrogation of this driver, the bodyguard, Muhammad Ibrahim, right? And the first five hours were basically the driver telling me how much trouble I'm in because I arrested the wrong guy. But he finally kind of wises up and he, he gets curious and he looks at me and he says, why are you after my boss, Muhammad Ibrahim? Who do you think he is? And I said, he's... The head of he's the head of the insurgency. He said every attack against every innocent Iraqi and U.S. military comes at the orders of Muhammad Ibrahim. And he said, Muhammad Ibrahim's my boss, and I'm his driver. He said, but he's never ordered a single attack. And I'm really upset at this guy. I'm about to start yelling at him. I'm really desperate because of what Bam Bam said. And he smiles and he says, there's only one man that orders the attacks. There's only one man that's ever ordered an attack, and that's the president, Saddam Hussein. And I said, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? He said, Saddam gives all orders to Muhammad Ibrahim. Muhammad Ibrahim gives the orders to his sub-commanders throughout the country. He goes, I drive Muhammad Ibrahim everywhere. He said, we carry a couple of million dollars cash in our trunk with us at all time, funding the insurgency. I said, where is he? Where's Saddam? And he said, I don't know. Only Muhammad Ibrahim knows. He said, I drive him everywhere. In the evening, he leaves. He's with Saddam in the evenings. So I went and I told Bam Bam, I said, man, we, we, we're, we're going after the ace of spades. We're going after Saddam. And Bam Bam said, man, we're shut down. He goes, we shouldn't have done that raid. He goes, the Pentagon found out that we messed with the head of security, his cousin. He said, we're shutting us down tomorrow. And I said, Bam Bam, I, I just broke this driver. He gave us five safe houses, places that he thinks Muhammad Ibrahim might be. I said, we can go get it. We can get hit these five houses tonight. And Bam Bam said, we're shut down. He said, we're shut down tomorrow. He said, so we'll raid all five houses tonight. <laughs> and that night, that's what they did. This Delta Force team, they go out and they raided all five of the safe houses that my driver knew of in Crete. And Muhammad Ibrahim was not at any of them. And Bam Bam brought in all the prisoners from all the safe houses and says, man, we're shut down in a couple hours. He goes, when the sun comes up, we're done. And I started my interrogations of these prisoners from the safe houses, right? And when I'm talking to them, they're all in the insurgency and they're sub-commanders and I could get them to talk. I mean, I could get these guys to open up quick. And they said, yep, Muhammad Ibrahim, he's running this thing. I said, where is he? And one of the, one of the prisoners said, he left to Crete. He's kind of freaked out. You guys were getting close to him. He went to this town of Samara. And then another prisoner said, well, listen, in Samara, he's got this sub-commanders at this house. And I went and told Bam Bam, I said, one more raid, man. Just give me one more raid. I found the sub-commander in Samara, and Muhammad Ibrahim will be there. And Bam Bam said, yeah, we're already pretty much in trouble. We'll raid the house. <laughs> and the next day, Bam Bam and the team raided the house of the sub-commander in Samara. 
And Muhammad Ibrahim was not there. But the sub-commander quickly says, he's like, Muhammad Ibrahim, he rented a house two kilometers away in Samara. And Bam Bam knew they were shut down. They didn't even come back to the house. They went from the sub-commander's house straight to the rental house of Muhammad Ibrahim. And when they raided the house, Muhammad Ibrahim was not there. But his son was. He had a 20-year-old son, right? And he was there. And he brought him back, and Bam Bam said, we're shut down. Here's the kid that was at the house. And I started talking to this kid, right? And I thought, just something. If I can get one more raid, maybe Bam Bam will do it. And if I can get a good raid and he'll trust that maybe he's there, I know we can go on one more, take one more shot. And when I'm talking to this kid, he tells me, he said, my dad was here two hours ago. He was at the house, the rental house. He said he left. He said, I don't know where he went. And I'm done. I'm finished. Like, even if all the prisoners told me every single thing they knew, they don't know where he went two hours ago when the Americans are now on his trail in Samara. There's nobody who can tell me where he is. And the kid did not know. And I just continue to talk to him, and I'm hoping and begging I can get something, and we're going all night long. And I'm talking to this kid about everything about his dad. And we're talking about his hobbies and what he likes to do. And he says, he loves to fish. I'm like, that's cool. I'm from Oklahoma. I think I'm the only one who doesn't love to fish in that state. <laughs> and we're talking. And he, I said, where do they fish? And he said, well, they fish right next to the Tigris River. They just built this pond. I'm like, what do you mean they built a pond? He goes, yeah, like six weeks ago, they built this pond. They fished right next to the pond. And, and it dawned on me, like it finally clicked. When I first got to, to, to Crete, one of the first prisoners we captured was Saddam's cook, right? And, and I talked to this cook, and he's like, yeah, I'm Saddam's cook. He eats one thing. He eats this fish. And the way I prepare it is called mazgouf. He's like, I'm the best mazgouf cook in the world. I'm Saddam's cook. And when the kid said they built this pond, I, I, I thought, why would you build a pond during the middle of a war in Samara? Unless you've got to stock the pond full of fish for the fish lover who can't go to the fish market. And I went to Bam Bam and I explained all this to him. I said, we have to go to that fish pond. <laughs> Muhammad Ibrahim will be at the fish pond. And Bam Bam said, you've been ordered to go home. So when you're in the army, you don't really get fired from war. You know, you just get told, we no longer need your efforts here anymore. Good time for you to leave. <laughs> and I'm leaving, right? And he said, we'll go on the raid. We'll raid the fish pond. He goes, but understand, I don't care if we find Muhammad Ibrahim or just some fish. This is the last raid. So whatever we get there, y'all are heading to Baghdad. But I knew he'd be there. It just made too much sense, right? And that night, Bam Bam and the team, they raided this fish pond. And he calls back on the radio. He said, we got two packs. It means two people. And I'm like, yep. Got to be Muhammad Ibrahim. Might be Saddam. Maybe not. <laughs> Probably would have gotten that heads up from Bam Bam on the call. <laughs> but it's definitely Muhammad Ibrahim. Calls back 20 minutes later. And he said, it's a dry hole. He goes, it's just two fishermen. He said, man, just get your stuff. Go down to the helicopter pad. I'm bringing the fishermen. You guys are all going back to Baghdad. And I got my stuff, and I went down to the helicopter pad, and Bam Bam and the team met me there, and they gave me the fishermen, and we took all these other prisoners that pretty much I've used for this hunt over the last five months, and they loaded up on a big Chinook helicopter back to Baghdad. And I said goodbye to the team. And I left to Crete. And I went back to Baghdad. And when I got there, I met by the team of interrogators. And they said, what did you bring? What, who, is, who are these people? They said, we, we're here for high-value targets. Who did you get? 
And I said, man, these are the people I was trying to find Saddam Hussein. <laughs> he said, in Tikrit? You freaking idiot. Didn't we tell you? There are no high-value targets in Tikrit. There's no one there. And I said, well, two of these guys we just got last night. And they're like, oh, the fishermen? I said, yeah, what are you going to do with them? He goes, we're, we're going to let these guys go. He goes, they're, no, they're nobodies. And I said, well, let me interrogate the fishermen. And that evening, I started my interrogation of these two fishermen, right? I brought the first one in. I started talking to him. And I set him aside, and I brought the second one in. And immediately, I knew their stories were different, which is awesome if you're an interrogator. And I started going back and forth on these two fishermen, right? And it took me 13 hours. But 13 hours into this, I had finally got one of the fishermen. He breaks. And he said, I work for Muhammad Ibrahim. He said, my cousin is another Muhammad. His name's Muhammad Hadair. That's Muhammad Ibrahim's deputy. And I knew that was his deputy. He's, and this fisherman says, I'm his cousin. He goes, they hired me. I catch fish out of the river, and I stock this pond. And I said, where did they go? And he said, my cousin, this other Muhammad and I, we had this mutual aunt and uncle in Baghdad. He goes, I think they went to Baghdad. And I said, well, that's freaking awesome, because we're in Baghdad. <laughs> and we get the map, and we got the exact location. And I called the Bam Bam of Baghdad, right? Like the, the, the team there in Baghdad. And I said, man, I got an awesome raid for you. So we got these prisoners. I'm, I'm the interrogator from Tikrit, and we got a solid raid. And he said, <clears throat> are you the guy that brought in the fishermen? I said, yeah, but I have a legit raid after this bodyguard. And he said, Eric, we do five raids a night. He goes, we're busy around here. I said, can you do my raid? He said, I'll put it on the list. I'll put it on the list. And that's all I heard. And, and I was told, I'm leaving. My flight out of country leaves in three days. So I just sat around and waited, right, and hoped they would do this raid. And the days came and went, and I'm supposed to leave at 7 o'clock in the morning on the third day. And at 1 o'clock in the morning on the third day, I'm sitting in the prison, and the Bam Bam of Baghdad calls. And he said, man, we had a slow night. So we did your raid. He <laughs> said, Muhammad Ibrahim wasn't there. He said, but uh, we can bring in your prisoners if you want. I said, yeah, bring them in. And they brought in these four prisoners, and they said, that guy is supposed to be the guy that owns the house. So I started with him, and I sat him down. I took off his hood, and I started interrogating him. I started talking to him, and I realized... And this guy isn't from Baghdad. And the more I talked to him, I said, this guy's from Tikrit. This guy. And the more I talked to him, I'm, and I'm, I'm remembering, I said, oh my goodness. This, this, this is the other Muhammad. This is the deputy. And once I revealed that to him, I looked at him and I said, you're going to take me to Muhammad Ibrahim. And he looks at me and he said, I don't know Muhammad Ibrahim. He says, as a matter of fact, I've never met anybody named Muhammad in my entire life. <laughs> That's not a good start. But it took two hours. Two hours later, the deputy of Muhammad Ibrahim looks at me and he says, I'm the deputy of Muhammad Ibrahim. I said, where is he? He said, he was at the house last night. I'm like, oh, gosh. I'm like, where would he go? Where would he go? And this deputy's kind of confused, right? And he said, he was at the house when the soldiers came. I know those soldiers. They don't miss anybody. I'm like, what does that mean? And I thought, do we have Muhammad Ibrahim? Is he one of the other prisoners? And I went to the guard, and I said, the, the, give me the other prisoners. Where are they? And there was just three soldiers sitting there on the ground, handcuffed and hooded. And I'm thinking, is one of these guys Muhammad Ibrahim? I'd never met him. I'd never even seen a photo of him. But I knew exactly what he was supposed to look like, right? Muhammad Ibrahim was supposed to have this John Travolta-looking chin. You know that one? 
and, and I went over to the first prisoner and I lifted off the hood. And that was not Muhammad Ibrahim. <laughs> and I lifted off the second hood and it definitely wasn't him. And as I'm lifting off the third hood, I saw the chin. <laughs> and I was shocked and I just said, man, you're Muhammad Ibrahim. I've been waiting to meet you. And he said, yeah, I've been waiting to meet you too. See, when I went to Tikrit, I was supposed to be there just one day. And I took a single change of clothes. And when you live in Los Angeles and you go to war and you're told as an interrogator, you look less intimidated if you wear civilian clothes. The civilian pair of clothes I took to Tikrit was a pair of khakis and a pair of shorts and a, and a short sleeve baby blue button down shirt. Well, I had to wear my army uniform for all the raids. So every interrogation I conducted in Tikrit was wearing this short sleeve baby blue button down shirt. And after you interrogate about half the adult male population of this small town, you get to be known as the inspector in the blue shirt. And he said, yeah, you're the inspector in the blue shirt. He said, I've been waiting to meet you too. So I took Muhammad Ibrahim into the interrogation booth. And I said, man, there's only one thing we're going to talk about. And that's the exact location of Saddam Hussein. Remember Mr. Fun-Loving Whiskey Drinker? He says, man, you're crazy. He goes, you give me way too much credit. And I looked at him and I said, I didn't give you any credit. I said, I came into this country, I didn't know anything about anyone. I said, but the 300 prisoners I've interrogated, they give you credit. And I said, the 40 family members that you got involved in this insurgency that I now have in prison, they give you credit for ruining their lives. And I went through all 40 names. I said, they walk, you give us Saddam, and they go free. If not, we will find him. But if we find it without you, you get nothing. And he looks at me and he said, if I take you, they'll kill me. And I said, you're they. You're the they, man. You're the only one that can do this. And no one's coming after you. You're the only one that can end this thing. And he said, I can't do it or they'll kill me. He didn't say he can't do it because he didn't know. He just said he couldn't do it because they'll kill him. Well, now it's six o'clock, right? I'm supposed to be at my flight and the interrogators come in. They said, hey, you're supposed to leave the country. And I looked at this Muhammad Ibrahim, this guy I've been going for for all these months. And I finally get him and I said, I'm leaving. And nobody knows what you can do. They know you're a terrorist. They know you're an insurgent leader. They're going to put you in jail forever. They're not going to give you this chance. I said, this is it. This is your time to get something out of this. And he said, they'll kill me. And I said, I'm leaving. I'm leaving this country. And when I do, I said, no one's going to come talk to you. I said, when I get on that plane, I said, when you change your mind, I know how this story goes. I just ran out of time. I said, when you change your mind, beat on the walls of your cell, right? This is the wood boxes we put these prisoners in. I said, bang on the walls of your cell. And he said, I can't do it. And I said, make them come talk to you. Go crazy. And I put his hood on him. And I took him back to his cell. And I went and grabbed my bags to leave the country. And a few minutes later, the interrogator's picking me up and they're driving me to the flight line. And as we're going, one of the interrogators, one of my buddies said, hey, did you get, that's your guy from Tikrit, right? Like, that's your top guy. And I said, yeah. He said, what'd you do to that guy? I said, I didn't do anything to him. He said, the guards, they're freaking out. They think your prisoner's lost his mind. They think he's trying to kill himself. I said, what are you talking about? And they said, he's banging his head against the wall of his cell. And I knew he's giving him up. And I jumped out of the truck, and I went to the cell, and I grabbed Muhammad Ibrahim, and I sat him down, and I took off his hood, and I said, where is he? And he says, I'm going to help you find Saddam. And I grabbed Muhammad Ibrahim, and I said, you're not going to help us do anything. You're going to take us. And I've never had a prisoner grab me. <laughs> Muhammad Ibrahim grabs me. And he said, you want to go? 
He goes, you and me, Mr. Inspector in the blue shirt, right now, let's go. And I'm shocked, and I said, where is he? He said, he's in Tecrete. <laughs> he said, yeah, I knew it! <laughs> but he drew the exact sketch and the map, and he said, he's at this house, the house of, Maha of, of Case Namek Jassim. He says, just south of Tecrete in this little town called Edouard. And I went outside and the interrogators are back. And I said, the prisoner just broke and he's going to take us to Saddam. And they said, really? Where's Saddam? I said, he's in Tecrete. <laughs> and they said, Staff Sergeant, go get on the plane. I said, he just broke. And they said, go get on the plane. And I gave them the map and I said, just call Bam Bam. Please call Bam Bam. And I got on that plane, and I left the country. And when you're at this task force, you don't just go back to, to the United States. You go to Doha, and the next day we're doing this out brief. And I brought my whole link diagram the next morning, and I'm all excited to get my brief. And I don't know what happened. And I knocked on the door, and the task force, this officer opens the door, and he said, briefing's canceled. Clunk. <laughs> and I knocked on the door again, and I said, I don't think I can leave the country until I give you guys an out briefing. Um, I'm the interrogator from Tikrit. And he said, are you Eric Maddox? I said, yeah. And he brought me in and he closed the door and he said, briefing's canceled because we got him. We got him last night. And I said, how did it happen? And he said, well, when you left, we called Bam Bam. And Bam Bam and the team came down on a helicopter and they picked up Muhammad Ibrahim and they took him back to the house. And yes, in, in that day, they, they, they planned for the raid all day. And that night, the next night, at 8 o'clock at night, they raided the farmhouse of Kais Namik Jassim. And they couldn't find Saddam. And after an hour, Bam Bam finally went to the truck and he got Muhammad Ibrahim out of the truck and he takes off his hood and he cuts his handcuffs off and he says, where is he? And Muhammad Ibrahim walks the team around to the side of the house and, and the bodyguard, Muhammad Ibrahim, starts kicking at the dirt. And Bam Bam and the team realize he's kicking up a rope. And they spread it out and they start digging it up. And the rope was connected to a lid. When they lifted the lid, there he was, Saddam Hussein. That's how the United States military tracked down the Ace of Spades. Thank you.